Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I know I'm standing, probably like you heard before, I'm standing between you on a long weekend. So thank you for sticking around. I'm uh, going to try to keep this lighthearted and, and quick and share some thoughts with you. Um, I'm very humbled to be here, really. Thank you to Paco and Karina and the Rev team for the invitation. Um, it's really refreshing to see how the conversation about data science has changed over many years. I've been part of the data science community for many, many years, and I've attended many conferences. And what's, what's really cool is the fact how, how data science is being talked about right now. You know, it used to be like, oh, well, it's something that these guys are doing over here or gals. And now you see how it's really becoming a, a main business function. I mean, there really is a lot of maturity in it. Um, I'm really happy to see that happening. I know it, it took a while to get there, but uh, I'm, I'm really glad about how the conversation has shifted. So, models, human progress through models. Okay, A-B testing, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> human progress through models. Okay, fine. Uh, so I, I need to bring some levity. It is 2.30 in the afternoon. Um, but just, just to get back to the title, the title of the, talk, the title of the talk is Improving Human Outcomes Through Models. So that is a very altruistic title. It's a very ambitious title. And, and when I was working with the organizers, we kind of agreed on it. But after sort of putting all my thoughts and stuff together, the reality is, is that, no, I mean, I'm not going to tell you how, how to make humanity better. There's, other people that are much smarter than I am working in very, very hard problems. Um, but what I am going to show you, though, is we're going to talk about a few of these ideas. And uh, some of them have been addressed many, many times throughout the conference. But these are really uh, the focus of my talk today. It's going to be about, really about the human side of data science. So how community has a huge impact on, on, on the work that you do on the companies that are hiring, on the organizations, how important communication is as a skill set in data science, which is, you know, we, we've heard about all the technical skills, and, and those are great, but there's, there's a whole other dimension of, of skills that, that are really, really needed for you to be successful, whether you're a practitioner or you're a team leader or manager. Um, how, do, how, to up, how to help people upskill, uh, in the sense like, you know, how do, how do you help your team learn, get better? How do you help your friends? How do you, as a, as, as a practitioner, just, just get better at this field or, or, or learn more about what's going on? And then I'm going to share a little bit about my experience working in the federal space. So um, I didn't say that before, but I, I work for Microsoft. I'm part of the Azure federal team, and I work with federal customers, helping them bring into the Azure cloud all of their advanced analytics, data science, and machine learning workloads. So I get to talk to a lot of the practitioners that are within different agencies. Uh, my focus is mostly on the civilian agencies, so everything that's non-defense and, um, and non-intelligence, which pretty much gives you the bulk of, of the US government. So you know, I've talked to the Department of Labor, the Transportation, uh, HHS. Uh, these are all different agencies of the US government. So um, just to set, set the stage a little bit about the backstory, um, as I said, I, I've been with Microsoft for about 18 months. Um, before that, I spent three years uh, working at Booz Allen Hamilton, which is a, a federal contractor. And before that, I was doing a consulting on my own. I spent uh, some time in a couple of startups. But I've been in the data science space since about 2010, roughly. And I actually got started in the data science space kind of really by accident. Uh, I, was, I, I was working at a small company. I wasn't happy. I found a blog post a long, long time ago that was called The Three Sexy Skills of Data Geeks that was written by a fellow named Mike Driscoll, uh, who's a friend of Peter Kaskamark, who spoke earlier today. And I met up with him, and he told me two things back then. He says, like, read the elements of statistical learning, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and it's a very heavy read, and learn R. So that's what I did. <laughs> and long story short is, Really, over time, what ended up happening is uh, I, I started running the R Meetup group in the DC area 10 years ago. And through that, um, we, another, another friend, you may know him, his name's Harlan Harris. He's in New York City now here. He used to be part of the local uh, Meetup community. He moved to DC, and we, we started uh, the Data Science DC Meetup. And then that eventually turned into what's called Data Community DC. Now, Data Community DC, and that's really, th this is really where I draw the inspiration for this talk, because having been involved in building a community for a really long time, 
and I can really tell you how, how advantages this, like, that it's really an advantage if you have one locally. Um, but even if it's not local, you know, just, just, try, to, just try to join it. And, 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 and as a sort of bigger R slash data science community, it doesn't necessarily have to be at a given place in time. You know, there's, there's folks all around. But the point is that through building community, I really learned a lot about what it means. And you know, throughout my life in general, you know, you're, I've been affiliated to many communities over the course of my life, whether it's a religious community or a school community or whatever. So there's, there's this common theme. Um, I also teach. I teach uh, at Georgetown and at GW. So uh, I live in Washington, D.C. area. And, and I've been teaching in, their data, in data science programs at these schools for a couple of years now. And, and that's sort of where I draw the inspiration for the academic side and the upskilling. Because I'm looking at this from multiple directions. You know, sort of as a practitioner several years ago. Um, in my current role, I'm not necessarily like practicing data science, but I am working with the data scientists to help them achieve their goals with our, with our platforms. So um, Data Community DC started in 2012, and over the course of the years has grown into a community of about 25,000 people, in, mostly in the DC metro area. Uh, you know, we use the Meta platform. That's, that's, that's how many folks are associated with our community. That doesn't mean that all these people come to an event. That, that would be awesome, but that doesn't happen. But, uh, but it, it's been a pretty vibrant community, and, and I can tell you that over the course of, of the last 10 years, you know, all of the different opportunities that have come my way has really been through the community. And, and that's kind of, I'm getting ahead of myself, but sort of like the punchline, one of the punchlines, or one of the thoughts I want to leave you with today is, as whether you're a practitioner or you're a manager or a leader, like really get involved and support your community, your local community. We'll talk about that in a second. So first of all, government. So, Data science and analytics in government is, is different. You know, it's different than what it might be in industry. Because, um, I mean, government wants to get better, but the reality is that government has a very different um, mission and motivation than industry. And, you know, I'm not here going to, this is not a political science class or anything like that. I'm not going to sort of define government, but, you know, government is taking care of, of society, of its people. And by doing that, it, it's really, really more of like addressing the social nature of, of, of folks. Um, a lot of the things that the government, a lot of the problems that, are, that, are, that the government is trying to solve are not necessarily tied to a profit metric, right? So that's a, that's a really big difference. Now, that doesn't mean that you can use the same techniques or approach the problem. So what I wanted to bring up is really this, this what can one learn from one another? So before I, before I do that, I did want to say a little bit about government. And again, the, the government, if, Increases in efficiency in government doesn't necessarily mean an increase, uh, an increase in profit. Government is focused on solving problems that industry perhaps can't or won't, um, just because. And, and also leadership within government is a very, very different beast. So what I have seen, what I can tell you, though, is that government has adopted best practices from industry. And I see this working with the folks at the agencies. You know, one of, one of the things I see pretty, pretty frequently is how the newer generation of workers coming in, they're coming in skilled, they're coming in ready to tackle these problems, they're coming in you know, ready to use the tools that they've learned in school, they want to use open source, they want to contribute to the community, they really, really want to use the skill set to help the, the nature of government to solve whatever problem. You know, data science and government is used across many areas, you know, that things as critical as defense and security, but also improving processes within, within different agencies. Like, for example, uh, we did a project once uh, this, was, this was a couple of years ago but with, uh, with one agency that was looking to take a bunch of job postings for a federal program and really scan through them. It was like 50,000 job postings. So you know, we, they use machine learning to do that because you can't really have, well, you can, but it's really not efficient use of time. But the point is that there are things that you can help, uh, definitely, and, but the motivations are different. So government is definitely learning from industry. In, in the sense of they're really trying to adopt tools. They, they really are, and they're, they're making a, an effort. Not, not everywhere, but um, there, there's also a very big discrepancy. There's an older generation that's been around for a while, and you know, they use the tools that they knew how to use, um, and they're going to retire soon. And there's really a void that's being filled slowly with, with a newer generation of folks that really, really want to come in with energy. So, so, so there, is, there is, I mean, I, I am really hopeful. Like, I, it's really great to see this happening, because. A lot of times you think of government, you think of a big, stale uh, organization. And the fact is that it really isn't. And, and 
it might be in places, but it, it isn't in others, so. Uh, one of the other bullets here was about sort of the, the pitfalls or, or cautions about uh, giving non-data scientists tools to do data science. No, uh, I think Nick spoke about this yesterday at the keynote, you know, about kind of the whole drag and drop thing. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get too much into it. I am of the belief that, you know, I kind of uh, think along the same lines as Nick. Uh, it's great that there are tools that allow folks to do data science, but I still think that you need to have a level of understanding of, of what you're working with. Um, so again, I, that's not the focus of this talk, I just wanted to mention that. Value, so, you know, going back to this idea, like how, how does, one of the bullets is communicating value of data science, and that has been addressed a lot throughout the different talks today. I mean, you can use data science for all sorts of tasks, and it does bring value. You know, you wanna focus on things that add value to your organization, um, and I, I, think, I think the there is evidence sort of across all the different talks and presentations that we've seen here that, that it is a, actually a valuable function that is being addressed and, and sort of addressed greatly from a people perspective and organizational perspective and whatnot. So again, I'm not gonna spend too much on that. And what I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk really is, is talking about community. Uh, well, actually, first of all, we'll talk about upskilling. So because one of the ways to upskill is through community. So really, I'm, get, I'm getting to the punchline. Um, really, with, with an, with an upskilling, you know, there's a bunch of different skills that are necessary to do this kind of work. Of course, there's the technical skills, and, and we all know that. And there's a lot of material out there. You can study on your own. You can learn it. You can learn how to do R. You can learn how to do Python. You can learn deep learning. Uh, you can learn all that. Um, business skills, I guess it really depends on where you come from. If you're coming from a business school, I mean, you sort of have that experience. But really, at the end of the day, it's about work experience. So, you know, a lot of times what I see is really hard for, for new grads or new data science grads as they come into the workforce to really associate where, you know, they, and, and we've heard it yet again and again throughout the course of this conference is like people want to come in and they want to work with the latest and greatest algorithm, you know, the shiny new toy, and, and they fail to sort of associate, well, what, what's the bigger picture? Um, and when I say business, I kind of bring business and communication skills together because not only do you have to sort of set the stage as to what impact or why, why am I doing the work that I'm doing, but also how am I gonna work with other teams? The reality is that you are gonna be a part of a multi-person organization unless you're in a small company. Now, there is that middle space, right? I mean, we've seen talks from Netflix, uh, you know, we've seen talks from Google, uh, LinkedIn, et cetera. These are, these, are very, these are organizations that are very mature in, in, in data science and they've learned the hard way over many years, how to manage the teams, how to set them up, et cetera. But the reality is that the majority of people probably are in, in smaller organizations. Maybe you're a team of one, maybe you're a team of two, maybe you're a team of three or, or more. And the challenges that you have are gonna be very, very different, right? You don't have someone that's building you a platform, right? You don't have uh, sort of all this particular infrastructure. So you really have to sort of learn how to augment those skills outside of data science, outside of machine learning. You know, you really have to learn about DevOps. You really have to learn about big data. So, so there's a bigger, broader spectrum of skills that may or may not necessarily be addressed uh, in, in a boot camp or, or in a graduate program, but, but what, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is just keep those in mind because if you're, if you're a one or two or three person show, you're gonna have to do all this stuff. And, and there is a lot of material out there, but you do need to learn it, and it is, it is really important. And communication. Um, in my, so in, it, I teach a big data class at Georgetown, and again, these, we, we are training students to go into the workforce and work as data scientists. So one of the things that I try to do really is, even though my data is a technical, my, not my data, my class is a technical class, uh, I still try to focus a lot of it on communication and presentation and things like that. I, I, I do have an MBA, I did go to business school and I actually got into data science sort of from the other side. A lot of folks come in from the technical side. I came into data science from being a business analyst and having really bad tools to work with and couldn't get access to the data and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really what opened the doors for me. But 
but having been formally trained in sort of this business school sense, you know, it's really important how at least business schools train folks and to come into the workforce and, and, and know how to function within, within, within corporate America or, or smaller organizations. But communication is a really big thing. And I don't care what anybody says, but if you can't communicate, if you can't work with other people, it doesn't matter how great you are technically. Um, so we'll get to that in a second. So going back to this idea of upscaling and community, well, how do you do all this? Well, what's the answer? Community. Um, so through the work that we've been doing at the, with the community, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's an organic growth. It's a self, I guess it's what's called self-fulfilling prophecy. So by having a community of people, right, you draw other people who bring in new ideas, who cross-pollinate with one another. And then with all the different meetup events that we have, you know, we always have a sponsor, we have people that come and say that they're hiring, so uh, what we end up doing after a meetup is we go for, for drinks, we call it data drinks or data beer or whatever, and I like to joke around and I say that's where the magic happens. Because it's true. You know, people come to an event, you sit down, you hear a great technical talk or whatever, you learn something, we try to focus the events that at least one, at least people walk away with one nugget, one new nugget of knowledge. But, it's really afterwards where the magic happens. You know, folks get together, you have a beer. If you don't drink, that's fine. I mean, it, the point is you get together in a, in a less structured environment uh, and, and barriers come down and you start talking to people. It's like, hey, what do you do? Oh, I'm doing this. Oh, oh you know, I've tried whatever. I've tried uh, using iGraph with R to do a graph and, and I don't love it. Well, try GGraph because it's much better, you know? So you start getting all of these different ideas and, and people really start learning from one another. And, I started running the R Meetup group without knowing R. And I learned R by listening to other people talk about the work that they're doing. So it is great. I mean, honestly, if you want to learn something, run a meetup or teach, honestly, like, <laughs> seriously. Uh, but really, the value you get from community, you, it, it's very hard to quantify, don't get me wrong. But you do see the long-term value because as more people start coming, joining the community, you get more ideas. You get, at least in the DC area, right? We have a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of tech in, in the DC area, and even non-tech, even government. You know, government needs talented people. Folks come to events, they hire from the community. The community gives you sort of uh, informal vetting process. You know, you know people who know people who know people, and by talking to that person, you already have a, some kind of reference that, you know, the person is known, you know what their skills are. Um, I'm gonna talk about inclusivity, because that's really a big deal. You know, one, one of the things that I found great about the data science uh, community and the art community at large from the very beginning is how welcoming they were. And, and, and that's a value that has transcended everything that we've done, at least, uh, at least in Data Community DC and what I've seen in, in the community at large. But it's really important. And you know, through organizations like, for example, like Our Ladies, uh, who are really trying to uh, promote the value of diversity and inclusivity. They've done a phenomenal job. And you go to, I mean, our meetups 10 years ago were pretty male skewed. You go to meetups, you go to the conferences like the New York R Conference or the DCR Conference or ODSC or, or Pi Data Conference, and you see a lot more diversity. Why? Well, because of the work that these folks are doing, but also because of the community, because people feel safer. People can come and they can learn in a safe environment. And yeah, you, know, you find your group, you find your group of folks and you make friends. I mean, I've made so many great friends in the last 10 years because of all of this work that we've been doing. And, and, and that's really like what I wanted to leave you with is the, this idea that, that community matters. And, um, you know, kind of to close, to close out, like what does that really mean from a leadership and management perspective is really support your local data community. You know, let your, either yourself as a leader Get involved with the community, whether it's through sponsorships or, ha or providing space or whatever. You meet the folks. You get involved. Um, let your teams participate in the community. You know, let them go and learn from other people because um, they're going to come back with new ideas. It works. Trust me. Um, also, by and by coming to the community, they're going to talk to business people. They're going to. They're going to. They're going to. It's pretty heterogeneous. It's, it, it is so. You're going to find folks with a whole bunch of different skill sets, and you're going to just just collect the collective knowledge aspect of it. Um, I'm going to talk about the T-shaped team in one second, but this idea of a T-shaped team is that you, if you have a team, or at least you're, if you're building a team, and really this is more focused to the smaller organizations. Uh, you know, I'm not excluding the, the the big boys or gals, 
um, you really want to have a team that has sort of a core skill set that it's relatively equal across the board, but then you have like each person is specialized in a different area because that way they can collaborate, but then there's a specialty across the board. You don't need expert, you don't need three or four experts that, you know, the unicorns. Well, that's not going to happen, first of all, it's really hard. Um, if it were, great, but, but the reality is it is a team sport, you've heard this again, and, 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 and I'll talk about that more in just one in a second. And then if you're hiring, uh, if you're a manager and you're building a team and you're leading a team, you know, go beyond the, the technical skills. Like really look at, at the individual's creativity, curiosity, because that's gonna, that's gonna get them a long way. If someone needs to know R and they don't, and they know Python or the other way around or whatever, it, like, these things, like once you know one, the other one is really easy to learn. And, but if they have context, if they have some experience, like that, that's really valuable. And again, industry experience, real world experience is really, really valuable. Uh, other, other things that I really advocate for is uh, communication and tenacity. Just this idea of, you know, if the folks have the desire to succeed and, and you can see it and they show results, great. And if they can communicate, I mean, you, you, have, a, you have a great candidate. Going back to this idea of the T-shaped um, T -shaped professional. So in 2013, um, Harlan, who I spoke about before, uh, Sean, uh, another friend, and myself, we were being asked, at least in the DC community, like, you know, people would come to me and say, hey, I wanna hire for whatever, a machine learning guy, or, or I wanna hire a, a, a data visualization person, or whatever. And you know, we, we, we knew the people that came to our events, but we didn't really, but beyond their name and perhaps where they worked, and if they told us who they were, um, we didn't really know much about them. So we decided to do something about that. And what we ended up doing is we ended up creating this survey. So this is an O'Reilly publication. You can get this online for free. Uh, it's, it's an EPUB, uh, it's an e-book. And this was, pu we published this in about 2013. And some of the ideas here, I think, I think uh, some of the ideas in here are, are still, I think, relevant today. Um, but again, it really depends on where your organization is. If you're, a, if you're a mature organization, like, you know, like, you have processes in place, you have HR policies, you have your engineering team structured in a certain way. But if you're in the majority where you're like a smaller organization and you're really trying to take advantage of the talent and the function, then I hope that this gives you some, some ways to think about how to structure your team. So, we did, a, it, this was an informal survey um, that we, you know, we posted on a line. I believe we got about 250 results across the globe. Uh, we analyzed the results, so we did non-negative non matrix factorization. And what ended up happening is we found these clusters of skills and, and that we ended up sort of naming by, by the vast majority. So the first one, and this was prevalent, for, this is what the data told us uh, from our survey. And, and we, when we looked at this, it actually kind of makes sense. It, 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 this started giving a lot of, and our, 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 this survey, our, our work was actually, has been quoted, has been quoted many times over years, even folks that write about sort of teams today sometimes refer to this work back then. Um, but the point is that there are different skills and here's how you want to think about them. So you have kind of the data business person, which as you see, is pretty skilled in business. They may know some R in Python or some other tool. Uh, they may know some statistics. Uh, so I think the, the width of the bar is, I think, the relative proportion of the folks in, in our survey, and of course, the length is the, the, relative, uh, the relative amount of skill in that particular area. So we have like the data business person, the, the data creative was sort of a jack of all trades. They kind of dabbled in machine learning, they dabbled in statistics, they dabbled in web UI programming. So think of the person as a jack of all trades, maybe the big data person. Um, the data developer was focused more on perhaps like backend systems, and then data researcher was someone who perhaps came out of a grad school program like social sciences or more of like traditionally trained uh, science. But, uh, and what ends up happening, so this is a referential, it's a referential diagram at the bottom, but that's what the T, the T professional means, right? You have a, kind of a core set of skills that are, that all of your members have to some more or less degree, and then, you know, that each person is sort of specialized in, in a particular area. And last, uh, just for levity, so this is uh, from a chat, this is the, called the Bad Data Handbook. This is, uh, this was published in a 2013 timeframe. This is a collection of horror stories of working with data that was compiled uh, by Q, uh, Ethan, and I'm one of the, I'm the author of one of the chapters. And 
when I was asked to write that chapter, he, uh, he said, you know, we'll talk about sort of your horror stories of working with data. And as I went and sort of looked back through the work I had done, and it, I, I found some patterns, and I decided to do some mental clustering and bucket them and call these different areas my five commandments of things not to do if you want to be successful in data science. Now, okay, this was published about, what, six years ago? Um, I still think that a lot of the elements or the ideas here are pretty relevant. Again, it really depends on the maturity of your organization. But the first one is, like, know nothing about thy data. You can have all the data in the world, but if you really don't know much about it, if you don't know how it's generated, if you don't know the nuances, you know, you, you're, you're, missing, you're missing half the value. Uh, the second one is, thou shalt provide your data scientists with a single tool for all tasks. And I think that problem has really gone away. Um, that one's probably not as relevant today. But five, six years ago, you know, it was really hard to, to get organizations to embrace open source, you know, to let folks use the tools that they know how to use and that they, that they, that they want to and they know how to use. Why did they learn and wh how did they know about this and how did they learn about this? Through community. And, you know, kind of that pull strategy where they're bringing in that knowledge in. Uh, thou shalt analyze for analysis sake only. Uh, only should be there. And this is really refers like doing analysis for the sa or machine learning or data science for the sake of doing it. Uh, it makes makes really no sense. Uh, thou shalt compartmentalize learnings. I think this is also an area where we're seeing a lot of progress, which is really organizations starting to realize that you know the the data fiefdoms, the data kingdoms are really not helping, and and that's really the idea that you really want to work collectively across boundaries within your organization, the, depending what it is. Um, but, but that was pretty prevalent you know, a few years ago. And, uh, and the last one, thou shalt expect omnipotence from data scientists. Again, this idea of there really depends on your organization, but the reality is that there are those unicorns out there. They do exist. I am not one of them. <laughs> but you know, they're, they're hard to find, and they're probably working somewhere making a lot more zeros. Um, so. Thank you very much. Uh, again, really, I, I hope that you can embrace these ideas and go back to your organizations and help your teams, mentor your teams. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, ah, sorry. So thank you so much. Uh, have a great long weekend, and thank you for coming to my talk. And I think we have, uh, I could probably, we probably can take a couple of questions. I'm happy to answer some questions. Yeah. Have you been able to get uh, buy-in from people internally? Oh. Have you been able to get buy-in from people internally to help incentivize this kind of external professional development for the data scientists in the Azure Microsoft community? It happens organically. So what has happened is, you know, someone comes to the meetup and they attended a really good talk and they go back to work and the next time they bring their manager and then the manager sees like what's going on and they're like, oh yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So it's sort of like the proof is in the pudding. So, but, but because we've been around for a long time, uh, we're, we're, people know about us and, and if you ask anyone, you know, it's like sort of like, where do you go for data science events, whatever, like everyone says, and there's a whole bunch of different meetups. What we did is we really tried to form a whole structure around these different meetup groups, which still functions somewhat independently. But uh, there, is a, there is a board, like, so Data Community DC is actually now a 501c3 nonprofit. And what we do is we provide sort of a scaffolding for all of the different events to have their program. We help with the fundraising and whatnot. But, but each event is still managed kind of independently. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of crossover. But, but back to your question is, I, I think, well, I, I think, no, I've seen it, how, how someone's come to an event and they love it and they bring their, their team next time and then they bring their manager and then they're like, yeah, we, and then they, you start seeing them come all the time. So, yeah. This is more a plug than a question, but um, through a lunch conversation, someone created a Slack channel that was posted um, you know, in the app and I think that, okay, in-person is awesome. I love in-person. I've gone to the R meetup and the R conference and it's amazing. But I think there's also something I think this group at this conference is a really neat sweet spot of, right, it's like people who have experience working through similar problems. And so um, 
it just wanted to plug, you'll see it in the activity feed, so check it out. There may be other Slack groups that are good, but I think it was just in our lunch conversation, wow, there's not really a clear network of you know, people kind of in this phase. So just wanted to give that shout. And thank you so much. I think community is so important. I'm really grateful to, you know, for all the work that folks like you have done towards it. So thank you. It's very gratifying. Um, it, it really is. So. Yes. We heard about uh, the importance of models and being model driven. What are you seeing in the, in the communities? Are people looking at models to drive their organizations? I am gonna give you the typical consultant answer and it depends. It, it really does, you know, some, some organizations have a real need and they know what they want and they know how to get there and definitely, you know, you see a lot of data-driven organizations. Some organizations are not there, they're still, I mean, back to the federal government use case. I mean, I still work with customers that still have their data in Excel and, you know, person A owns a bunch of spreadsheets, person B owns a bunch of spreadsheets and, I mean, it, it's even going back to basics. So, you, it's the, you see the entire spectrum. I do believe that as a lot of this, the skill set is more prevalent in the workspace, um, you know, more and more organizations are going to understand the true value of, of, doing, of doing models and analytics and data science for their particular purpose. So the true answer is it really, it, it, it depends on where you are. There, it, it's becoming more prevalent, but, but there's still a ways to go. Any other question? All right, folks, have a happy holiday weekend. Uh, and again, thanks for sticking around. I really, really appreciate it.